much, everybody, for joining me this afternoon. My name is Mary Alby, and I will be presenting session two of Film Preservation Basics, Practical Steps for Preserving Your Films. Um, for the folks that had a chance to join us in person yesterday, we did a, sort of a demonstration with some hands-on stuff about film handling and care. And we also got into identification and assessment. So things to look for when you're doing a film inspection. Um, so the first part of this workshop, we'll do kind of a brief overview of that. And then we'll get into um, some additional topics like storage and disaster management and um, further resources that you can find uh, for working with your films. So um, let's get started. So I kind of just went over this, but I wanted to start, you know, just talking about uh, what this workshop will cover. As I mentioned, the first two sections where we discuss film handling and inspection guidelines, it's really just a review of a lot of the stuff that I covered in detail uh, yesterday in person. Um, and then we're going to go into storage recommendations, equipment and supplies, uh, considerations for doing digital transfer projects. So if you want to get your films digitized. Um, questions to ask and things to consider. Um, disaster management, what are some common um, issues that can crop up with um, motion picture film in particular? And how do you either help prevent those disasters or mitigate them if you're dealing with them? And then um, all of my references for this uh, workshop, basically there's, um, there's a lot of information that I've called from various sources. And I kind of list them all in order at the end under my references. And those are just your resources for um, further information. And I'm happy to help connect people. I'll include my email at the end of this presentation. And if anyone is you know, looking for a particular piece of information, they're not sure where I got it from, or they want to know more about something that I mentioned, and they're not sure which link to follow up with, please send me an email. I'm happy to connect you to the resource that would be best for you, but I do list all of those links at the end as well. Okay. So I apologize for the folks that had uh, a chance to join us yesterday. I'm gonna do just a really brief overview um, to give the folks that didn't have a chance to join um, a little bit of background about myself before we get started. So I've had an interest in film since childhood. Um, primarily because I've had a family history of eight millimeter filmmaking, which is what a lot of folks who have home movies have experienced as well. Um, both my mother and my grandfather shot eight millimeter films. And since 2012, I've had experience working with 16 millimeter film, film handling and pre preservation. Um, as a grad student at Simmons, I attended my first EMEA conference, which that's the Association for Moving Image Archivists in 2017. And during that time, I also interned at Northeast Historic Film, which is a regional moving image archive located in Maine. And um, after that, I worked as an archivist at Vermont PBS for four years and primarily worked on their 16 millimeter film transfer project. And I've also had the opportunity to collaborate um, with Rachel and Fred on Home Movie Day events in Vermont um, since 2018. And Rachel, I can do this at the end too, but if you have any um, information about the upcoming Home Movie Day that you might wanna include in the chat, um, that would be great. I just wanna use this as a plug that we're doing Home Movie Day this upcoming Saturday at the Albany Town Hall in the NEK. Um, so it will be this Sunday evening and I'll be there to work with folks one-on-one -on -one to, if you want to bring your films and have me look at them with you and talk about their condition. Um, I'm really excited. I love that kind of work. So just a little plug for that. Okay. Um, so again, this first section, film handling and care guidelines, this is a little bit of a review of yesterday. And again, I talked about this more um, why I'm so passionate about this medium in particular. It's because film is a really excellent archival medium and it will, if stored correctly, last for over a hundred years, probably outlasting any surrogate information, including digital video and digital formats. Okay, um, 
So some of the guidelines we talked about yesterday, safe film handling requires equipment and supplies. There's a range of things that you can get um, depending on your budget. So it definitely, you don't have to have every supply out there in the world, but you do need some basic things to get started. Um, some of the guidelines that I mentioned were make sure you set up in a clean, well-lit and ventilated area. If you have access to um, clean lint-free cotton gloves or a nitrile powder-free gloves, um, those are really great to wear when handling your film so that you're not leaving any fingerprints or any scratches on the emulsion, the image on the film. If you have to hold the film with bare hands, like if you're working with a piece of damaged film and it's really delicate, just try and hold it by the edges so you're not leaving any of those marks. And um, never use a projector to view your film if you haven't assessed its condition first. Sometimes this might work out fine for you, but projectors can also inflict additional damage to films if they're already weakened by decay or tears in the film, if they're shrunken, for example. And I'll get into how to look for those things in a minute, but I do just wanna mention that um, it, it's amazing to watch your films being projected, but you would just wanna exercise some caution before you do that and make sure the films are in good enough condition. Um, so film handling continued, examining the film before you view it. And it's basically just, you use all your senses to look at the film. So you're safely removing it from the can. Some of the cans can be kind of rusty and hard to open. So you just wanna exercise caution when you're opening it. Um, I mentioned yesterday having a dust mask can be handy if you're opening films and you're not sure what the condition is because you wanna do a visual check. Is there any mold on this? Um, is there any vinegar syndrome, which I'll get into that in a little bit of how to um, assess whether a film might have vinegar syndrome. But any of these things, if a film has maybe been decaying and you're not really sure when you first open it, it's just nice to have some protection so that you're not breathing in mold spores or things like that. Um, as you're opening up the film and you're looking at it before you even look at the film itself, you wanna copy down notes or other description, descriptive information that you see on the box or the can that can help you identify what's on this film and um, who's in it, what year was it, all of those things. Um, using rewinds, I have a photo of the ones that I brought yesterday and set up and worked with. Uh, these are 16 millimeter rewinds, but they come in sizes for each gauge of film. Um, it's easiest and best to use manual rewinds when you're just doing a visual inspection for film. And if you have a film that's mounted on a core and not a reel, then you can get a split reel that sort of just unscrews and allows you to put the core right on the reel like that. And other tools that can be really handy um, in the image here, that's a, a viewer for 16 millimeter film. And you can, you can get those for eight millimeter and super eight also. But what I demonstrated yesterday was just a light box. Um, that's not gonna enable you to really watch the film in the same way that you would watch it on a viewer, but you can certainly get an idea for the types of content. You can see specific images and you can do a lot of work um, inspecting the film in some ways a lot better with a light box than you can with a viewer. So I definitely recommend um, looking into those because they're pretty affordable, they're pretty portable, um, and so it's nice if you're really just trying to get an idea of what, what the film, what the content of the film and its condition, I think light boxes are really great for that. Um, okay, again, uh, so we we're all set up. Those are the general guidelines for setup. And then the next step is gonna be identification and assessment. So this is sort of like the detective work that we do to figure out as much as we can about this film, because the more information that we have, the better equipped we are to decide what to do with it, how to store it, whether or not we wanna digitize it, all of those things. Um, so again, this part's just a review from yesterday, but I did wanna include on this slide, you can see um, just the relative distance and size between different film gauges and uh, Rachel pointed out yesterday, you know, the what we call these films eight millimeter, 60 millimeter, that's the actual width of the film. So that can be another way to, if you're not sure 
what size film you have is just can be by measuring it. Um, all right. So here are some of the things that we're looking for when we do a film inspection. And the first thing that we're gonna do is try and write down um, technical specifications. So this includes things like, is it color film or is it, si is it black and white? Is there a soundtrack or is it silent? Um, what year was it manufactured? Is there any damage and decay? All of these kinds of things. Um, I mentioned yesterday that I think it's really helpful to use a standard inspection sheet sort of as your guide, even if you don't follow it to the letter, it's helpful to remember sort of what sort of things to look for. And I have um, an example of that on the next slide. Film rulers are also pretty affordable and they can be a helpful tool if you have a reel of film. Um, you can sort of put the ruler in the middle of the core and then you can read the measurement out to understand how many feet of film you have. Um, there are some reels that also come with those measurements sort of pre-done on the reel. So always check for that to see if you have one of those. Um, oops, sorry, let me go back. Uh, yeah, there are also things called footage counters, which are certainly a more precise tool. And if you have access to that, that works great too. Um, they can be a little bit more expensive. So the film rulers are handy for that reason. Um, in terms of looking for the date and when the film was manufactured, uh, you can use Kodak edge codes. There are, um, there are charts that you can use to figure that out. And so I'll show that um, on, a, on the next slide. And let's see here. Oh, I do just want to um, mention a note about splicing and film repair and cleaning. Um, you definitely wanna look for splices that are in need of repair or if the film's broken, like if a, sp a splice has come undone. Um, those are definitely things that you can make the investment in getting a splicer and um, getting tape and sort of reading the instructions and practicing how to do that with film leader is what I would suggest before doing it on actual film. But if let's say you have a collection of home movies and you're thinking about getting them digitized, um, the other choice that you can make is to contact the vendor and ask them, you know, do you repair and clean films prior to digitizing them? Because that will save you a lot of effort of having to get all of these various supplies and become a pro at splicing and things like that. Um, there might be scenarios, like if you're working in an institutional collection where it makes a lot of sense to invest in some of these basic supplies and know how to care for your films in that way. But it's always a choice that you can make to sort of outsource, outsource that work to someone else who's a professional who knows how to do that really well. Um, because especially if you ever wanna project your film in the future, having really strong, well done splices is key for that. Um, yeah, so moving on, this is the print condition report that I mentioned. Um, this is in my list of references and I mentioned it quite a bit at the session yesterday. The Film Preservation Guide, the basics for libraries, archives and museums. It's available online for free as a PDF. You can download it. Um, you can download individual sections. It's from the National Film Preservation Foundation. And it's got everything that I'm covering in this session today and more, um, but at the end, it includes this print condition report. And so you can see, you know, just like I mentioned, you're looking for things like what's the length of the film, black and white or color, silent or sound, uh, what gauge is it eight millimeter, super eight, 16 millimeter, uh, what's the film base, and then there, there's this whole section here, which has been really helpful for me just in thinking of like, what types of damage would you look for on a film? Um, has the color faded? Is it warped or shrunken at all? If it's been projected a bunch, it could have oil or dirt from the projector on it. Um, there might be splices in need of repair or the perforations on the edges might need repair. And then scratches is a really common thing that you see, especially with home movies, if they haven't been stored within a box or a can. Um, so yeah, this is a really helpful tool and I use it quite a bit. Again, this is just another visual of like things that we're looking for when we do a film inspection. 
This is again, just like the relative sizes of different film gauges. And uh, I mentioned soundtracks a little bit yesterday. I wanted to include this visual of what an optical soundtrack looks like. It's basically these high contrast wavy lines that are printed directly on the film um, and read just right in the projector uh, using light. Whereas the magnetic soundtrack is like a thick brown strip that you'll see, it almost looks like a, any other tape, like an audio tape. And you'll see it's just a strip running down the side. And if you don't see either of those two things, then it's fair to assume that your film is a silent film, um, which is certainly the case for most small gauge films. Certainly most home movies like eight millimeter or super eight films. Um, and then this is again from the film preservation guide. It's uh, the date code chart that I mentioned. So for Kodak, that's going to be the majority of the films, certainly that I've come across. I think with most people, um, you're going to be looking at Kodak film and these date codes were repeated every 20 years. So if you have a sort of a ballpark idea of who's in the film and what year it might have been, this should help you narrow it down. These symbols are printed sort of right at the top, very close to the edge of the film. They're usually early on, but sometimes they can be repeated. Um, and you would want to use something like a loop or a mag some kind of magnifier in order to see them really clearly. You can just see them uh, if you look really closely, but it's easier to have some sort of magnification. And again, um, one thing I'd like to just have people remember about this is it's not always the, the year that the film was shot. It's just the year that the film was manufactured. So someone might have purchased this film and then had it sitting around for a while before they ran it through a camera. So it does give you a good ballpark. Um, it's a, a helpful tool, but it, does, it won't always tell you specifically the year that the film was shot. Okay, so for storage recommendations, so how can we extend the life of our films? What's the absolute best environment? Um, and the photo that I chose here from the National Archives is a um, picture of films in cold storage, because I think um, most people would agree that that is the optimum environment for films is cold storage. But as I'll get into, there are a range of different things that you can do, especially if you have a collection at home, like I do, I have a collection of films at home and I don't have them in cold, in, you know, cold storage in the same way that a lot of big film archives do. So um, I can share a little bit of what I do personally and, um, just some industry guidelines as well. So here are best practices. Um, if there's one point on the, I know I have a lot of text on here, but if there's one point that I can really hammer home from uh, the storage section, it's just that temperature and moisture are the two main factors that accelerate the rate of film deterioration. So if you keep the temperature as low as you can and you keep the relative humidity in the area you're storing your films as low as you can, that's going to extend the life of your films. So in general, um, what you want to avoid is storing your films in um, attics, basements, flood prone areas. Uh, we're looking for a stable environment. You don't want any sort of environmental extremes for your films. Um, and I'm sort of jumping ahead, but I include this list, um, it's from the Library of Congress, because on the next page I include a temperature table, which does have like industry, industry standard temperature recommendations for films. But again, in home collections, not everyone can store their films under those conditions. So this is sort of a, a really good list from the Library of Congress of just practical guidelines of what you can do um, to keep your films in the best environment possible in your home. So you just want to keep the relative humidity as low as possible. So make sure it's a dry area. It's cool, as cool as possible. So you don't want to have them right next to the fire or any kind of heating vent. And you want it to be a clean area. So again, that's another reason why attics and basements are not ideal. Um, maintain distance from radiators and vents, again, for heat and for keeping um, pollutants down. Films should be wound securely, evenly, and neatly. 
this part here with a three center diameter emulsion side out. Um, this is more for larger films like 16 millimeter and larger gauges. I know not all small films are on a core that large. So just keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, the whole idea be behind that piece of keeping your films wound securely is that you don't, I've seen so many times films that were just sort of spooling off the reel. They weren't stored properly in the can. They were maybe just on a reel. They weren't taped or secured to the reel itself. And then this film just spools all over the floor. You pick it up. Um, you can very quickly with film get into a situation where if it starts unwinding, then all of a sudden you have a big pile of film and trying to get it back on the reel without scratching it or, you know, just doing minimal damage, it becomes a whole chore. So the way that we can avoid that is just when you're done with the film, just keep it securely wound up. Um, what I recommended yesterday is like, ideally you should have a long length of leader at the end of your film and then just tape it to the actual film with acid-free paper tape. Um, and then the film, whether or not it's on a reel, ideally it should be in a protective enclosure that physically supports it, blocks out the light, minimizes exposure to dust and airborne pollutants. Um, as anyone would know, just being in your house from time to time, you know, dust is just gonna accumulate even in clean environments. So if you keep the film in a protective enclosure like a can um, or an archival quality, you know, preservation quality cardboard ideally, or if you have a home, um, a collection of home movies, if you have them in all the original boxes. Um, yeah, anything just to minimize the light and minimize the dust landing on your films. And it's recommended that if a film is being stored on a core, that it should be stored horizontally. Um, if it has to be stored on a reel, especially bigger films, then you can store those vertically. Um, I mentioned taping the film to uh, the end with acid-free paper tape. And I also, I just like to mention that it is possible to freeze your films. Um, I know some folks that have 16 millimeter films that they shot and then they digitize them and they just said, I'm not gonna need to access this for a while. And so they wanted to go through the effort of freezing it because that really extends the life of your film. So um, there's something called the Home Film Preservation Guide, which I have in my references and they give really detailed steps for how to prepare your film for freezing if you wanna store it there for long-term preservation. Um, there are just specific steps that you should take if you're interested in doing that. And then again, most folks aren't likely to encounter any nitrate film, but I do just, because we're talking about storage and there are laws that govern the storage of nitrate film, I just want to mention that it's a highly, fl highly flammable material. Um, it's only going to be 35 millimeters. So if your film's smaller than that, you definitely don't have nitrate. And if for some reason you have a suspicion that you might have a nitrate film, um, the Association of Moving Image Archivists, they put out a guide on how to identify and handle nitrate films. So I would definitely consult that. Um, okay. So this is the temperature table that I mentioned. And again, it actually includes um, magnetic media like videotapes and optical media like DVDs too. And those are quite different um, from the recommendations for film. So I think it's just really interesting to look at those side by side. But as you'll see here, um, depending on the film base, you know, you can get away with various temperatures. Um, like for example, polyester film is, is a little bit more stable. Um, so it's, going to be holding up better at room temperature or cool temperatures, whereas acetate film and particularly nitrate film, um, you always wanna have them in cold or frozen storage. But again, a lot of people in their home collections might have acetate film. And so that's why I, like, I wanted to lead with the other guidelines because it might not last, um, like the ultimate, it might ha not have the most extended life possible if you're keeping it just in a cool or a room temperature environment. But that doesn't mean that your film won't 
last and be preserved in good condition for many, many decades if you're just taking small practical steps to keep the temperature pretty stable and low and to keep the humidity low. So don't be intimidated by this table, I guess is the point that I wanna mention. Okay. Um, so disaster management. So what happens um, when we encounter a film that maybe hasn't been stored in the optimal conditions? And uh, first of all, what can we do to prevent that? And if we encounter a film that has already suffered some damage, um, what are the steps that we can take to hopefully remediate that damage? The image that I included here is of acetate film decay, which is also called a vinegar syndrome. And you can see this is how the film starts to look in advanced um, vinegar syndrome. It begins to shrink and get um, curly and wavy like this, and it loses its flexibility. So that's what it looks like. Um, so I wanted to begin with vinegar syndrome, because this is probably one of the most common things that um, people with any kind of film collection might encounter. Um, the decomposition of acetate-based film is called vinegar syndrome because during the process of decomposition, acetic acid, which is the main component of vinegar, is emitted from the base. And then I sort of just list out the typical pattern for decay. And I mentioned this at the session yesterday. It starts with this sort of strong vinegar odor. So that's sort of your first clue. And then at the end, the film no longer becomes flexible and the emulsion will flake off from the base. So at that point, the film is kind of a loss. So basically what we wanna do is sort of interrupt that from happening. So what do you do? Um, if you suspect that you might have a film that has vinegar syndrome, well, the Image Permanence Institute uh, creates these strips. They're called AD strips, and they detect and measure the level of acetate film deterioration. And they can tell you what is the level of severity or decay. So they're blue strips, and it's basically a color coding system where you take one of the strips, and there's um, there's a guide with instructions of how to use them, but the basic overview is that you take a strip and you would lay it flat on the film within the can or however you're storing it. And then you wait a certain amount of time. And if the film turns from blue to green, for example, then that tells you it's one stage. And if it turns from green to yellow, that tells you it's another advanced stage. So it's basically just a color coded system like that. Um, if a film registers a level higher than 1.5 of vinegar syndrome based on those strips, it should be moved away from healthy films because it can spread to other films that don't have vinegar syndrome. And so that's one thing that I would recommend in terms of prevention. If you're getting sort of a whiff of vinegar with any of your films, even if you don't have these strips, if there's one in particular that you look at it and it's based on the smell and maybe the way it looks or how you know it was stored, if you think one or two films in particular might be susceptible to vinegar syndrome, I would definitely make sure they're stored away from any of your other films that are healthy. Um, there are also some more complex tools that you can use. Kodak makes uh, something called a molecular sieve that it can be used in storage to help slow down the vinegar syndrome reaction. But basically, the most important thing that you could do is just um, make sure that if it was an, an environmental extreme of like high humidity or high temperatures that you're removing it from that environment and putting it in a more stable environment. And if it's a home collection, I would definitely prioritize trying to digitize a film like that, perhaps sooner than others, because then you don't have to worry as much about preserving it for the long term, knowing that you also have a digital copy. Um, if it is an advanced stage based on, you know, some of the things that I list out over here, then in that case, it would need to be uh, moved to frozen storage and either duplicated or, um, you know, digitized in order to preserve it. So that's vinegar syndrome. The other disaster management piece I wanted to touch on for film was water damage. Um, I've just been thinking about this a lot. Since the flooding in Vermont this summer, and um, I'm sure that there are more than a few households that had some damage to maybe their family film collections. So again, the best um, the
the best way to deal with something like this is to be prepared ahead of time. So I just want to take a moment to talk about prevention. So um, in the future, if you think, you know, you might experience water damage or some kind of flooding, make sure you've got your film stored in a really good storage. Ideally, it would be, you know, a durable sort of archival plastic film can whenever possible, because that will help protect it from water, especially flood waters. Don't store your films on the floor. Make sure they're raised up above the floor. Um, just keeping your films labeled clearly. Keeping supplies on hand. This is kind of like a general archival practice for disaster management, but keeping supplies like distilled water and buckets on hand because you might need to wash the films or keep them wet if they've gotten wet accidentally. Um, and this is a really good practice that I think is for archival collections, but also for people who have collections of home movies or photographs or whatever it might be in your home that's valuable. Just know your collection, know what you have and be prepared to retrieve your most valuable items in case of an emergency. So that's why sort of going through and doing these film inspections are important because then you can say, okay, well, this reel is 90% blurry footage with no one really important on it. And this reel has several people that are really important to me. And it's maybe a significant vacation we took, or it's a significant event in someone's life. And so just knowing what you have in your collection is a huge step um, to both any kind of disaster, response or even when you go maybe take the step to say I want to transfer some of these films to a new format it's always helpful to know what you have in your collection and what's most important to you um and then the final thing just in terms of prevention is building connections with other folks that have experience um in this area so other archives or laboratories that can assist you if it's um ever needed if your film does get wet um again this is sort of a general guide so each um, specific instance could be a little bit different, but the first thing you really want to make sure you do is to treat the film with care because wet film, all film is delicate in general, but wet film is especially delicate. Um, you do want to keep it moist and not let it dry out, which seems kind of counterintuitive, um, but that's true. And really, before you take any major steps, the first thing that I would recommend is to call a film lab or a film archive or an archivist that you um, know has experience in this area and just ask their advice. Because based on the specific situation, they might give you uh, certain instructions. So having that connection early on is really helpful. Um, the film may need to be rewashed in a laboratory or depending on the quality of the water. So if it's flood waters, like if there's been sewage or um, you know, a lot of dirt and grime in the water, then it may need to be just immersed in a bucket of clean distilled water before it even gets is shipped to a lab. So again, this is something that um, whoever the professional you make contact with, they can give you more specific directions, but that is something that's typically done. Um, if there are a lot of films that have gotten wet, then again, you might need to prioritize them. So this goes back to knowing your collection and knowing what's most important to you. Uh, you do want to place the film in a thick resealable bag with just a sprinkle of clean water, again, to prevent it from drying out before it would get to a lab. If there's a, a circumstance that... Um, that for some reason you need to wait several days before you ship the films to a lab, then you would want to refrigerate those films in their bags, uh, as I described. And then just the final thing would be determine if there are other disaster recovery professionals that are available to assist you. Um, so that's kind of an overview. Again, it can vary depending on the situation, but water damage is one of the other more common things that films that can happen to films. and if you take all of the steps in a timely manner, there's no reason why the film can't be saved and um, and continue to be preserved or a digital copy made before any damage has really happened. Um, so speaking of digital transfers, um, I wanted to include some specific considerations for um, working with vendors or if you're thinking, if you have a lot of films, or even if you just have a few films and you're considering taking that step, um, but you have a lot of questions. 
I wanted to mainly focus instead of like including a list of specific people that you could reach out to because a lot of those lists are already out there. I wanted to just um, focus on what are the types of things that you should be looking for and asking when you're ready to start transferring these films. Are you ready to sort of research? So uh, I mentioned this to uh, a couple of the folks that were attending yesterday. But um, the Center for Home Movies, they're an amazing resource. Um, they're the folks that are behind Home Movie Day. And they're an amazing resource for um, for anyone that has questions about their home movie collections. And just in general, they put together a lot of work for professionals who are um, embarking on digitization or transfer projects. And so this list of questions came directly from their website. Um, I have it linked again in my references page, but this isn't the all of the questions that they include there, but these are some of the ones that stood out to me as being uh, really important to us. So I wanted to include them here and uh, give my explanation of why I think they're important to us. So the first one, probably the first thing on most people's minds when they're thinking about digitizing their films, what is the price of your transfers? And what is the basis of your pricing? So is it just based on the length of film, the number of films that you're sending, the number of copies that you want back, the total runtime of footage, each archive or transfer service will do things a little bit differently. So it's good to get an explanation from them of that breakdown and they should be able to provide that for you. Um, does the price include cleaning and repair of my films before transfer and what method of cleaning do you use? So this again goes back to um, the film handling and care section is there are various things that you can invest in, but especially if you have a home collection, it might be easier to outsource some of the repair and cleaning work to a transfer service. So asking these kinds of questions of is that standard for you to just clean up and repair the film? in general before transferring it. Um, that's something that can be really helpful to know if you're wondering whether or not you should try and do that work yourself. Um, what kind of equipment do you use for film transfer? So you can see here, this is um, this photo is an example of one of the methods of film transfer. There are several different, um, there are a couple of different methods for digitizing films. And again, I think um, one of the most important things to look for if you're on someone's website or you're emailing with them or you're on the phone with them is you just want to start asking these kinds of questions and get a sense of um, how much information can they provide you about their process and how much can they tell you about what basically what they do, like what their process is and then why they do it, what's their rationale behind the process that, the process that they've chosen. Um, so I would say like that is a great sign if a transfer service has a ton, the more information that they have about their process and what they do and why they do it, um, the better the better you can feel about sending your films there and the less information there is about process and the less someone can explain about what they do and why, that kind of, to me, would be a red flag. Um, one important thing to ask, you know, everyone wants to know how long the work might take, you know, how long it'll take for them uh, to send your digital copies to you and to send your films back. This can vary for each service, depending on what their workflow is and how much work they have at the time. So it's always good to ask, um, do they use a method of shipping that's going to allow you to track your films or to track the films that they're sending back to you? And then the final, and for me, one of the most important questions, will you return my original film to me with the transfers? The answer to that should always be yes. And, you know, you can send me an email directly or you can contact the Center for Home Movies if you have any, if you encounter any services that are listed that um, either, that they don't include that, they want to retain your originals for some reason. Um, that's definitely not something that should be happening within the industry. So make sure you get your films back because those are great to keep for preservation purposes, even once you have a digital copy. So now that I've covered all of this content, um, you might be interested in getting some of these, uh, 
supplies, getting some of this equipment so that you can, you know, view your films and do some more work with your films on your own. Um, so this section is basically just going to cover some of the basic tasks you might do for film handling and preservation, some of the supplies that you could um, get for that, and common places of where to find them. Okay, so the thing that I've you know, try to emphasize along the way is that there are different options for different budgets. So, and for depending on whether you're an institution or you're just someone at home and how much you want to get invested in this work, there are certainly different options that you can work with. Um, so again, most of these bullets here are taken from the, um, the film preservation guide, which I keep uh, bringing up, but they sort of suggest this list of activities that you do um, when you're working as a film preservationist. So one of them would be, for example, replacing containers. That's a great way to extend the life of your films. And so they just include, you would need film cans or boxes. You would need some labeling tools, gloves, safety glasses. If you wanna be working with those lint-free cloths, et cetera. And so my annotation just underneath each of these categories is places that I've been able to successfully find these items. So for me, a lot of these tools have been um, just from regular archival suppliers. I've gotten cans typically, ooh, sorry, from Gaylord Archival and University Products. Anything that's really special uh, for film, like I'm trying to think, um, well, you can certainly get cans and things like that from film editing shops like Christie's Editorial. Um, this next category here, if you're looking for things like inert plastic pores, film cleaner, um, those I think are really easier to find at film editorial shops. And I mentioned Christie's Editorial, which again, I have linked on the next slide because that's the one that um, I had a film archivist mentor who used that uh, website and that's what he recommended to me and that's the one that I've been able to use pretty consistently and um, so yeah there are some specific things like that but Gaylord Archival any standard archival supplier you can get things like loops um, you can get the the archival quality cans um, skipping ahead a little bit to what I mentioned a lot yesterday, I was working with a light box. You can get those really affordably um, from a variety of places online. I think I got mine from Amazon. It was under $30. Um, so if you don't want to have to invest in a film viewer, there are some of those like some of the older film supplies, like getting the actual rewinds for 16 millimeter or for 35 millimeter, if you had need of that, um, you might have to go to sellers on eBay for that. If you needed a film splicer, you might need to, again, find those used online in good condition. Um, and I think some of the folks who attended the workshop yesterday also man mentioned that like local community forums, like Front Porch Forum, just connecting with people who maybe had equipment that they didn't need anymore, uh, that you can find things in good condition that way sometimes too. Um, but again, yeah, new light boxes are available online in a variety of styles and price points. So that's sort of the number one thing that I would say that you could invest in if you just wanted to be able to examine film safely on your own. Um, and then, yeah, some of the more specialty things for inspection and data collection would be um, available from Christie's editorial, some archive suppliers for splicing. And that includes splicing tape, press tape, film cement, razor blades, scissors, all of that. Um, you can find them again, used online in good condition from places like eBay. Um, but the EMEA Global Supplier Directory is a great resource um, if you, want to explore that if you're looking for something, some particular um, film supplies, they have a really comprehensive listing and folks can um, sign up just to be included in that. So it's a pretty comprehensive um, directory. So that's another really good lo link if you're looking for supplies. But um, I guess I just want to mention one piece of caution, just if you are looking on eBay or other sites online for used equipment, 
you do have to be a really savvy consumer. Um, you have to look for things like, are there photos? For example, like if you're looking for a splicer and you're, you found one online and it's a metal splicer, are they showing photos of it from all angles so that you can show that, ensure that it's in good condition with no rust and things like that? Um, so yeah, just make sure that you have all of the information that you would want to have to be make an informed purchase before um, buying something used. So, um, yeah, that's the basic overview for film equipment. So there are a ton of links on this page, I know. Um, these are my references that I use in putting together this presentation. And I tried to use them, I tried to list them in the order that I use them. However, there are, I didn't group them by section because I ended up using several of them um, all throughout. But the film preservation guide, the basics for libraries, archives, and museums, again, an excellent free resource. Um, almost all of these are free resources filmcare.org from the Image Permanence Institute. And in terms of um, like just the wealth of information that's out there about film care, for example, the this general resources page from EMEA, that in and of itself is like another long list of um, links of just resources broken down categorically. So if you're looking for something specific, a specific topic, that's a great place to peruse. For folks that are watching this because they're interested in caring for their home movie collections, so 8mm Super 8 in particular, I would really recommend checking out littlefilm.org, um, which was put together by Bob Brodsky and Tony Treadway. They, um, it's just a really comprehensive guide specifically for small gauge film and for people that are uh, working with their home movie collections. So that's really helpful. And also, um, let's see, further down here, I, I included the link to the page, questions you might ask a transfer service, but this will also take you to the Center for Home Movies uh, website. And uh, just exploring the Center for Home Movies website would also be really great if you are mostly interested in caring for um, your family films. Um, yeah, and then I just used a couple of um, basic resources like the National Archives. Um, they have a bunch of guides for motion picture film guidance. Uh, they do identifying motion picture film formats. Um, they do emergency preparation, response, and recovery. Um, the Preservation Self-Assessment Program, this again, like the Film Preservation Guide, like filmcare.org, these are comprehensive resources just to tell you from start to finish how to take care of films, what to look for, how to do inspection, all of that. Um, yeah, and then there are more specific links about preparing films for storage, identifying and handling nitrate film, care handling and storage from the Library of Congress. And um, another really, really helpful link from EMEA, which can also be downloaded for free as a PDF, is Film Forever, the Home Film Preservation Guide. And that was the resource that I mentioned that has a step-by-step -step guide of how to freeze your films, if you're interested in doing that. Um, and then, yeah, Christie's Film Editing Supplies and the EMEA Global Supplier Directory are um, really great links for... Um, if you're looking for equipment and supplies, those are two that I would recommend. I didn't include links to just the standard archival suppliers. I figured most folks would either be familiar with those or would be able to um, just look them up online. But the two that I've used most frequently is probably Gaylord Archival and uh, University Products, I believe. Um, yeah, so I think that's mostly everything for my references. And then um, I'd be happy to open it up for questions. I'm really curious to know um, if folks have any feedback about anything that I've covered or if they have questions about um, specific topics. If for some reason we don't have time to get to things today or if uh, someone has to run, um, this email is what I use specifically for um, archival consulting work with films, vermontsoundandvision at gmail.com. 
um, if you have questions about anything I've talked about today or you're looking for a particular link or resource, feel free to shoot me an email um, and I'd be happy to follow up with you about it. Um, yeah, so that's it. I guess I will just sort of open things up for, for questions. I Maybe I'll just stop sharing for now and then I'll, I can share again if anything specific comes up. I, I have a question. Sure, go uh, ahead. I, uh, I I very recently I I you know my basement flooded and I um, lost a bunch of stuff, but it led me to discover a bunch of Super Eight films I thought I had lost, um, and they were in pretty good condition. So I I've been um, over the past few weeks slowly digitizing them, um, just because you know it's pretty expensive to do that, um, just doing like one reel at a time. Um, I'm curious, like, what your thoughts are on, like, is it, a, am I wasting my money by, like, getting Super 8 transferred in 4K? Um, I have been doing that, and I know I'm not gaining any resolution, but I feel like, like, is there any advantage in your mind to doing that? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I would say, so what quality are the film, are the films in really good quality? Um, so some of it is actually stuff I just shot. And then I just sent a batch of stuff that seemed like it was in pretty good quality. I, I you know, I did a quick look. It didn't have any mold on it or anything. So, um, you know, this is stuff that's probably like 20 years old, maybe 15 years old, but not totally destroyed. And did you say it was super eight or eight millimeter? Uh, super eight. Super eight. Okay. I mean, I think... I think you can always, there is always a case to be made for getting it um, transferred at the highest resolution that you possibly can, even if it's a smaller film format like that. Um, you want to preserve the quality of the image. And so um, it is tricky. Like if you're trying to make the decision on a, um, on a cost basis, then I would say that the larger, um the larger the film gauge the greater the argument that you can make for getting it transferred at a higher resolution however if it's sort of within your means and it's not too much of a difference um based on sort of a lower grade transfer i would say yes there certainly is uh, an argument to be made for getting it transferred in 4k if you're able to do that sure. especially with super 8 because the image is just a little bit um, like for amateur collections, I would say Super 8 is, um, you're going to get a better quality of image than if it was just standard 8 millimeter. Mm. Cool. Um, I, I've been sending my stuff away to uh, Negative Land in uh, Brooklyn. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, I, you know, I did a bit of searching, but is there anywhere like within, you know, the Vermont or just the New England area that does transfers um you know well i guess yeah yeah if you want you're talking about like a higher quality digital transfer it sounds like this is what you're getting yeah yeah certainly um yeah and I'm, I'm i'll be interested to look them up too because i'm i'm not super familiar with them probably just because they're in new york um and yeah, there are tons of folks um, in New England in particular. There's um, an independent film archivist. His name is John. And he um, his company is Film Video Digital. And he works out of Hanover, New Hampshire. Um, and when I was at Vermont PBS, he did all of the 16 millimeter transfers. I believe we had them done in... 2k at the time if i'm remembering correctly um but he could certainly help you he does provide um probably on par the same kind of transfers and also northeast historic film um yeah i think i if i didn't mention film video digital is in hanover new hampshire uh northeast historic film is in bucksport maine so again that's a little bit farther away um other places on the east coast um, in New Jersey, there's an organization called Spex Brothers uh, that is really reputable. I know I've consulted them before for um, videotape. I haven't recently looked at their site for what they do with film, but also George Blood LP. Um, 
again on the east coast um yeah they're really a high quality reputable organization for film transfers so those are just a few off the top of my head um the EMEA global supplier directory would have a really comprehensive I think they have a section just about transfer vendors so if you really want just to like have a big list to be able to choose from I would recommend to go there sure. yeah no I was just thinking like what's a place that I could maybe just drive to to drop stuff off yeah or, yeah, yeah. I think for the kind of transfers you're talking about the one that would be closest by would be the one in Hanover, uh, Hanover Film Video Digital. Yeah. Cool. Um, great. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. I might just jump in one. with a comment if that's okay. I, sure. One thing that I found challenging when I found myself with a container of water damaged films after the flood that I was trying to, to do right by was looking for guidance online from National Archives and other reputable sources, there was a lot of, of suggestions to go find a lab that could mm -hmm. clean the film for me. Yeah. So I, I did try to follow that line for a while, but that got me nowhere. You know, the labs I called said, yeah, we don't wash film anymore. <laughs> so, wow. um, so that it just, I was, I found myself, I think there's a space, Mary, and maybe VHRP and, and you yeah. can work on developing some more concrete guidance for what to do when you have wet films. Cause the last thing you want to be doing is a whole lot of internet research and you want it to lead you to like this, these are the five next steps to do. But I did waste a couple of days uh, kind of trying to pursue a lab option. Yeah. Again, like Garrett, hoping I could just drive the things to it and get yeah. them washed. Um, but I found myself like, am I going to try to wash these at home? Uh, <laughs> no, <Yeah. laughs> but you know, just this kind of, ah, you know, the, the way you feel when you're doing something for the first time. Um, yeah, you're, I think that's a great point because a lot of that guidance does make it seem like you can just get somebody up on the phone and they're going to walk you through the process. And especially in the middle of an emergency, like that is unfortunately not usually the case. Um, so yeah, that's a great point. I would love to, um, maybe we can chat more about your experience and how you ended up at like the final step and um, what what we could maybe do to help folks expedite that process in the future. Um, and I think it's just so great that in Vermont, you know, we do have these networks that sort of can come together to support folks. And that's why I wanted to include that piece of like, if you know other, preservation professionals, like just having those contacts that you can call, even if their specialty isn't film, you know, just having someone else that you can say, okay, have you been through this process before? And what steps did you take? Um, having that kind of network is extremely valuable, especially in case of emergencies. So yeah, it's great that we have that here in the state. Yeah. And I called John and then I called Paul at Video Syncrasies and got, got advice from them that kind of got me, got me on track. Yeah. Not great. that they could deal with it. But John would have if he hadn't been away. So he he is our probably our our best local local resource. Yeah, I would say so. Definitely in terms of someone that you would wanna that you would be able to drive to for assistance. <laughs> yeah, that's the closest. Yeah, uh, do any other folks have questions? Celeste and Marie here. Hi there. Hi. Can you see us? <clears throat> yeah. We're, yes, we're, I can see okay. you. I have a uh, box of an open film. Oh, okay. How long do you think that lasts? It's Ectochrome <laughs> color movie film from 1989. Would you be able to, um, did, you did you folks happen to get my email? I'll put it in the chat also. Do you think uh, you could send me either a photo or like some of the specific information on it? And I, I might have to, cause it will vary um, for each piece of film, but I'd yeah. like to make sure I'm giving you the accurate information there. So if you are able to email me the details or or an image of that, okay. then I'd be happy to get back to you. Yeah, there's a serial number in Super 8 EG 464. I'd also be interested to know, has that, do you know how that's been stored throughout yeah, the for, life of having again, it? With everything else, and it's pretty stable. Okay. Temperature and, and yeah, humidity. it was it was in a, a, a closet in my parents' bedroom that inside closet in inside closet it was not a closed closet it's where he stored all the film all the slides 
all his cameras, that kind of stuff. And I don't think there was a light in that closet either, so. We also have the camera. <laughs> oh, great. We yeah, can. I mean, um, it's sort of like I was saying that a lot of people end up going online to look for a, a lot of these supplies, filmmaking supplies, film editing supplies. So if you still have them in good, um, good condition in your possession, that's really, in addition to the films themselves, that's really a treasure. Whether or not you want to keep them and use them, or whether you want to, you know, someday pass them on or sell them, they're really, they can be quite valuable. I guess um, I'm getting it's not free to develop. So are, what are we risking to, it's out of. Yeah, of yeah. Of and I think, I mean, so I don't want to, I don't want to answer out of turn. I'd right. love to, to look at all the details and make sure I'm right. giving you the, okay. Um, okay. the best information possible. Typically, depending on the year, um, it may not be something that you're able to use at this point, but um, yeah, it can vary okay. based on the film. So I'll do a little bit of research to make sure I'm Thank giving you. you folks the best info. And I'm gonna just uh, put my email address in the chat right now in case anyone- okay. Yeah, wasn't. we got that. We have it. Okay, great. So I have a question about the home movie day on Saturday. Okay. Will you have AD strips there to test things i mean i looked it up last night thinking well maybe we should get some there were a couple of cans when we opened it there's they, everything looks okay visibly but we thought maybe we could smell a little bit yeah. but it's like you have to buy a bag of 250 of them which i have i absolutely. know i don't and need it, 250 but there might be some people who want to share i made a note yesterday you two to bring AD strips to home movie day. Cause I did buy a big bag and okay, I want to sh distribute them. So yes, okay, perfect. Perfect. that's a little carrot to get you guys to come. No, great. we, we went through <laughs> the films last night and separated the regular eight from the super eight. So we have them in two different boxes now. Oh, perfect. <laughs> um, You're going great. And I actually had an experience where I opened one. It was a, I guess like a five, no, maybe seven inch reel. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to figure out what it was. And when I pulled it out of the can, it started unspooling all over the floor. And I was like <laughs> panicking. Oh, my God. Stop, 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 stop. So I think we need to buy some paper tape, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'll have paper tape um, at, at home okay. every day. So that's Great. another plug. Great. Yeah, that's a very simple thing that I can do to help folks out. Um, just in terms of getting their films back home in one piece. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. Well, our daughter even said that she, she'll she come if you promise to show movies of her mommy as a baby. <laughs> oh, but I don't know which movies it is, is the problem. I mean, they're all, they're all labeled, but when we started looking at them, we found things that weren't necessarily what was in that film. So, you know, yeah. it's been so many years my dad tried showing them one Christmas to all of us when our daughter was like nine she's now 25 and he had such a hard time getting his projector working and so these things haven't been viewed for so long you know at this point that um it's hard to know when he he was kind of fanatic about labeling things so we, you know we're lucky that we have a pretty good idea of what's on each one but still it's hard to tell. Yeah, um, I actually thank you for um, telling that story because that actually brings up a really good point that I wish I had mentioned at yesterday's workshop, which is just notes can be really deceiving. Yeah. <laughs> so I was sort of emphasizing, like, make sure that you take note of like everything that's written on the film and everything that's written on the box. Yeah. Um, but I know from various projects that I've worked on that sometimes those can really lead you astray. And you might think that you're going to be uh, looking at one film and it ends up being a completely different exactly. film. Or, right. or there might be uh, what's recorded on there, but there may also be additional elements that right, there's right, no right. record of. So notes, while important, um, especially given individual situations, they're not the um, not the last word of what is on the film. Yeah, well, it's not as easy as videotape where you can actually mark down the time on the tape, you know, where something right. is. If you're sitting there writing down what's on a videotape, it's not quite the same in a on a film like this, yeah. you know, you kind of can just put down, okay, oh yeah, that's 
that one's Switzerland. Okay, that one is this. That, but anyway. So, so usually yeah. the the eights are how many feet per second? Sorry, what? On the super eight and the eight, uh, how many feet per second is it? Oh, um, I'm not sure. That's for fifty feet at eighteen frames a second, I think. Oh, okay. Thank you, Gary. What was that? Yeah. Fifty. It's no, like, I meant min second. I mean, yeah, minutes. Uh, got usually, minutes. one fifty-foot roll of super eight is going to be yeah. three minutes and twenty seconds if it's okay. eighteen frames a second, and then two and a half if it's twenty-four. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Wow. All right. <laughs> three twenty. Um, okay. Anyone else have questions or comments or? Um, I just I, wanted I, to say I, thank no, you sorry. for for hosting this. I'm from the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum and really appreciate this kind of overview. We're getting ready to do a big vendor digitization project, um, so helpful to have all these resources. And I think you might have said this in the beginning, but especially that last slide with just all those links, it would be great to get the actual links to those resources. I don't yeah. know if you can drop that in the chat or if it'll come through email later, but. Um... Um, yeah, I'm not sure what the easiest way to be if you wanna connect with Rachel or I, if anyone wants to just shoot me an email directly, I'd be happy to just send you um, sure. send you that whole list of links in Fantastic. whatever way. Easy happy to do that after the call. Thank you. Yeah, and that's very exciting, so. Yeah, we're really excited about it, so. Yeah, good luck with everything. Thank that's you. Great. Um, I'm just curious, like, uh, in your opinion, what is a better storage place? Um, like a, a room temperature dry closet or like a damp cool basement, but in like a box that is truly air. Like, could I just always avoid a damp basement or if it's cooler and it's like in a secure box that I know isn't going to get wet, is that better? Uh, <laughs> it's yeah that's sort of a hard question but I really want to say like avoid are they color films uh it's both color and black and white yeah um I'm really I think just based on like personal experience I have I just say avoid the high humidity like really avoid the high humidity um so no no to the basement if it's room temperature and it's not next to like a um like a heat source like a vent or anything like that um so I, and i can actually this is something that i meant to do uh on the storage section but i didn't so i have a collection of films at home um various family films and 16 millimeter films so like filmmaker elements and things like that and so i actually have um what's pretty close to like a standard archival shelving on the second story of my home. It's funny. It was like the thing that made me fall in love with my house when I started shelving. I was like, those are archival shelves. I can put some films on there. Um, so yeah, I just, it's like in the center of my home and it's just some really good sturdy shelves. Um, and it's room temperature, but it is part of a wing, like a small wing of our house that in the summer we do, um, because I have a young child, we do keep air conditioned. So we don't have like air conditioning in our whole house, but we do keep this one section of our home air conditioned in the summer. And there's no direct um, heat source because we have like a pellet stove and we have heat sources in other rooms. There's no direct heat source in the winter. So I know that year round, it stays pretty cool in there. And I do monitor the humidity and we have like a dehumidifier in there. So that's how I, you know, and it's taken steps over time. I didn't have all of that right away, but it's just over time, I've kind of invested to make it the best environment that I can for my films. Um, but yeah, I think personally, I would go with room temperature and knowing that um, the humidity was lower. Sure. Cool. Um, okay, anyone else? Well, thank you again. I just really appreciate everybody's time. And um, this was a lot of fun for me to put together. So thank you again, Rachel. Oh, thank you, Mary. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>